on undetected footprints, we are talking about an Orange County lieutenant was shot and killed by her husband, a former deputy with the department, who tried to make her death look like she took her own life. After he was caught having an affair on duty, said the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Lieutenant Ellie Shea, 39, was allegedly killed on Monday at around 2 p.m. at the home she shared with suspect Anthony Shea, a former sergeant. Anthony Shea is 49 years old. He is now accused of first-degree murder. According to the arrest report, the suspect called 911 to report that his wife had taken her own life in their bedroom, telling law enforcement when they arrived that they had been arguing for three days. We had a bad night last night arguing about my affair, he said. I cheated on her. There's an investigation. I quit because it was so embarrassing. That affair had become the subject of an internal investigation at the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Anthony Shea joined the department in 2006. He was accused of having of getting busy on duty. It prompted his resignation in August of 2024. When authorities responded to the couple's home after the shooting, they found Ellie Shea, who joined the sheriff's office in 2011, with a gunshot wound and later pronounced her dead at the scene. She lit up every room she entered with her infectious, bubbly personality, a beautiful spirit, and kind smile. Ellie was a mentor, a teacher, advocate, protector, cheerleader, and inspiration to women aspiring to be leaders. A loving mommy of two little girls ellie served her community with grace integrity and pride she will be profoundly missed the orange county sheriff's office wrote in a post on x according to the arrest report anthony shea allegedly provided a statement and granted investigators full access to search the home and electronic devices. He claimed his wife had called out sick from work and texted him requesting space. So he took their daughters to Publix and came back to find her dead. Surveillance video proves he did go to Publix with their children, the report states, but police said Anthony Shea inadvertently activated an audio recorder on his wife's phone, which provided a different timeline of events. According to your arrest report, Police believe the victim did call out from work and then text her husband to take the dog out and ask how the girls were. She also texted someone else that she thought she had food poisoning, but authorities say that was her last actual communication. Words cannot do justice to our pain in the OCSO family is experiencing this week as we mourn the loss of Lieutenant Ellie Shea who was shot and killed by her estranged husband on Monday, October 14th of 2024. Lieutenant Shea, just 39 years old, joined the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Detectives believe Anthony Shea sent a message from his wife's phone to his that read, Just to Brussels, Tony, I can't do this anymore. Please understand. It's too much. What you did to me. I can't anymore take the girls for a drive and give me some space please that's when he allegedly accidentally started the recording which lasts 54 minutes and captures him him telling his daughter i'm right here and all right just go she's sleeping a gunshot is not heard and authorities do not believe the victim was alive during the recording Authorities believe in that time, the suspect left with his daughters to Publix, came back, texted his wife that he had returned, went to the bedroom for 50 seconds, and then called 911. Hours into the investigation, Anthony Shea withdrew his permission to search, according to the arrest report. It added that he did not become emotional to her condition and tried to point 
deputies to evidence that would confirm his alibi. Based on the totality of circumstances, the investigation determined Ellie Shea did not take herself out. Anthony Shea did commit the murder of Ellie Shea and attempted to conceal his actions under the disguise of her taking her own life. Anthony Shea established an alibi through digital services, digital devices, and surveillance video. Anthony Shea manufactured evidence by sending digital communications from Ellie Shea's cell phone to his own. Anthony Shea denied Ellie Shea the possibility of treatment and life-saving measures by delaying contacting 911 for emergency medical services, the report states. Sheriff John Mena said in a statement, Ellie cared deeply about this agency and the work we do, and I considered her a rising star. We, uh, we have all struggled this week from feelings of shock, grief, and guilt while we tried to make sense of Ellie's death, which meant to appear as a appear as she taken her own life. I want to thank our homicide detectives who had the extra, extraordinary difficult job of investigating a colleague's murder for their diligence in ensuring justice for Ellie. It is devastating to know we will never again be on the receiving end of Ellie's kindness or warm smile. Anthony Shea is being held without bond at Orange County Jail. He could have just walked away instead of take his wife's life. Now their kids have to grow up with, without their mother and without their father. It's a sad, tragic situation. Up next on Law and Crime, they are speaking about this case. Let's take a look. A Florida Sheriff's deputy, a mother of two, is found dead, and a key piece of evidence points the finger at her husband, a former Sheriff's deputy himself. I'm going to talk with Police Sergeant Kyle Schoberg about the bizarre and tragic details of this new case. Orange County, Florida, where investigators responded to a 911 call from former Sheriff's deputy Anthony Shea, claiming that he had discovered his wife, Lieutenant Ellie Shea, dead in a pool of blood in the couple's bedroom. Now, the investigation eventually led police to arrest, of all people, Shea himself. Yes, he was later charged with murdering his own wife. Shea had been working as a sheriff's deputy for nearly 18 years and even alongside his wife for some of those years. So the question is, how did we get here? Well, before we get to this incident, we have to first talk a little bit about a major incident or a major key event that occurred in the months leading up to this murder. You see, in August, Anthony Shea's nearly 18-year career at the Orange County Sheriff's Office ended with his resignation. This after an internal investigation. Office released a statement reading, quote, that he resigned earlier this year while under investigation for allegations that would have resulted in his termination. So what is this all about? What were these allegations? Well, it turns out that Shea had allegedly cheated on his wife, Ellie, and as a matter of fact, he not only had an affair, but it allegedly occurred while he was on duty. So, with all of this in mind, these two having worked together, then the affair leading to Shay's resignation, how do we get to Shay being charged with his wife's murder? Well, let's start with the version of events that Anthony Shay told police. And this is all coming straight from the affidavit for his arrest warrant that we actually obtained. So just keep that in mind. Now, it says the night before Ellie Shea was killed, Anthony told detectives that she was becoming increasingly depressed over the internal investigation that he was facing, telling police, we had a bad night last night arguing about my affair. He went on to say that the following day, Ellie called in sick from work and he took the children to a Publix grocery store. He said to give her space. Text messages sent from Ellie's phone actually corroborate this because in the affidavit, there is a text message exchange dated October 14th where a message is sent from Ellie's phone to her boss and it reads, Good morning, Cap. I think I have food poisoning because I'm, I'm unable to hold anything down. If you're okay with it, I'm going to sit today out. About 20 minutes later, her boss replies with, Absolutely. I hope you feel better. This is a really, really sad case. Regarding Anthony's trip to Publix, 
there was another text message that was sent later that day from her phone where it appeared to back up what he told police because it says, I can't do this anymore. Please understand, it's too much what you did to me. I can't anymore. Take the girls for a drive. Give me space, please. Okay. Well, when Anthony returned home, he says that he discovered his wife on their bed with a gun on her chest, a wound to her temple, told police that he called 911 upon discovering her, performed CPR until paramedics arrived. Shea suggested that this gruesome scene was a result of a self-inflicted wound, but investigators started to look into this and they uncovered details that didn't quite match up with what Shea was telling them. You see, the first thing that raised their suspicions had to do with Shea's cooperation with the investigation because he initially gave permission for a full search only to seemingly change his mind hours later. This was confirmed in the affidavit. Then a review of body-worn camera footage was conducted and the officer made a very interesting observation of Shea's conduct saying Anthony Shea attempts to control the crime scene and direct deputies to evidence which will confirm his alibi. So after reviewing cell phone records in the body cam, homicide detectives began to suspect that Shea might have actually killed his wife, Ellie, and that he was attempting to cover this up. But what specifically led them to this conclusion? Well, this is where a crucial piece of evidence comes in. Somehow, according to the affidavit, the audio recorder was switched on accidentally and it stayed recording for almost an entire hour. So what did it capture? This is what officers took note of in the affidavit. A gunshot is not heard on the captured audio. There is no evidence to suggest that Ellie Shea was alive during the recording. The audio recorded message captures Anthony Shea returning to the bedroom and remaining in the room for approximately 50 seconds prior to notifying 911. Anthony Shea does not immediately provide medical aid. The 911 call is captured on the audio recorded message. Anthony Shea does not become emotional or react to the condition of Ellie Shea until the 911 call is answered by the 911 dispatcher. So it's interesting to note that the recording didn't pick up that he expressed any kind of emotion at what he alleged was a horrific scene, finding his wife dead in a pool of blood. Sure, everybody reacts differently, but you could see how that could be problematic for him. And so investigators, they believe that Ellie was alive and sent the text message to her boss indicating she was sick, but they believe that that was one of the last messages that she sent before Anthony Shea went upstairs to the couple's bedroom and shot her in the head. That's the allegation now. So Anthony Shea, he was arrested just days later. He was charged with first degree murder. And there's actually even more to this because as more court documents were obtained by local affiliate WFTV, they suggest that the marriage between Ellie and Anthony it had turned tumultuous long before she even discovered this affair. Documents they attained show that Ellie, who went by the name Nancy in the filings, begged a judge to get her away from her husband, even filing documents alleging that there was violence in the couple's home. And now you fast forward to the present day where Anthony's sitting behind bars accused of his wife's murder. What a story. So to help me break this down and the details of what is truly a disturbing and heartbreaking case, I want to bring in California Police Sergeant Kyle Schoberg. Uh, Kyle, thanks so much for coming on. It's good to see you. I don't even know where to begin in all this. First, talk to me about the internal yeah. investigation reportedly about an affair. What, what do you take away from that? Does that happen a lot? An affair on duty, nonetheless? Well, I don't want to say it happens a lot, but it's sure, it's, it most certainly happens. And if you have an officer that's having an affair while on duty uh, during the course of his employment, then, yeah, I mean, they're going to place him on an administrative leave. They're going to look into it, do a bunch of interviews. And, you know, it's obviously misappropriation of uh, money by the city that he's being paid. He's having an affair on duty. It's it's all bad. And generally speaking, if they can prove that that's what he was doing, then usually it leads to termination. And in this case, it seems like he quit in lieu of being fired. And so now we have that component of the story. And then we move into this killing. What do you make yeah. of his initial story that he told police? And remember, he is innocent until proven guilty. But that initial story, as I was laying it out, certain parts seem to be backed up by the text messages. Others, maybe not so much. Yeah, well, I think in this case, he's a police officer and he was a cop for, what, over 18 years? I mean, he's he knows the game. I mean, he's been to homicide scenes. He knows how these things are going to get investigated. So 
He's trying to use the cell phone, uh, which is a crucial piece of evidence that we all use in law enforcement, especially in today's day and age. I mean, your phone contains everything. Uh, so I think he was trying to use that angle. I, I think where he really messed up was it says that the uh, audio recording was inadvertently turned on, which obviously he was unaware of. And throughout that entire time when she was texting him, he's leaving the house. There's no sound of gunshot. So that alone is pretty compelling to show that how how would she have shot herself if there's no sound of gunshot, yet he's communicating with her. So I think he was trying to use, obviously, the cell phone as a, a tactic for his alibi, and it backfired on him when he somehow turned on her audio recording, and it, and it just proves um, his alibi. And then going back to him calling 911 and not having any type of emotion, I mean, I understand their relationship was bad. They're going through uh, potentially a divorce, uh, but I'm sorry, that's his wife. They have children together, and a lot of times investigators do go back and listen to those 911 recordings because they're they can't. That is pretty telling when someone's calling 911 and he's showing no type of emotion in his voice that he just found his wife uh, potentially deceased and shot in the head, uh, you know. And then he's not willing or wanting to provide a CPR on her. I mean, look, as cops, we respond to calls all the time. We don't know these people, and we perform CPR. I mean, if that's your wife. That's your loved one. You're you're going to do those things, no matter how gruesome you think it is. Or I'm just it, that's that's just hard to to believe that that he wouldn't do that. Uh, so and then you know he's trying to control the scene. At one point in the affidavit, it says that he's literally holding their iPad and he's telling the deputy, "Look, here's a timestamp when she was texting me. Uh, you know, he was he's wanting to divert their attention towards his own alibi, uh, which is." That is just odd in those type of circumstances. I, I've been to a lot of scenes, and they're heartbreaking, and you feel for the family. And I can't say I've, I've never had anybody actually do that. So those are all things that just compile against him. I guess the counter argument with that be he is a member of law enforcement. It is his home. Shouldn't he not direct law enforcement? The the investigators, hey, look at this. This is it's. It wouldn't be outside the realm of possibility for him to direct the scene because it's so unique to his uh, his environment, or would this be a situation you need to step back and let us do the investigation? I'm just trying to anticipate ways that he might be able to argue this at a trial. You could argue that, but I think when you put yourself in a human perspective, just finding your wife dead, you have kid, your kids are there. I don't think the first reaction of somebody who found their wife deceased would be to pull up an iPad and start proving your case that you weren't the one that did it. You would think that you would let the detectives you know, do their investigation. And then when that time comes to give your statement, all those things are going to be laid out there. But uh, for him to actually, while they're on scene, to be really pushing it to show that, hey, look, no, I was texting her or she was texting me while I was gone with the kids. Uh, that's just, it's extremely unusual behavior. And I, I would say, again, playing devil's advocate here for the defense, people respond to tragedy in all different ways. People would respond to a scene like that in all different ways. Is it always the case that, you know, you don't show emotion, you're complicit in what happened? Yeah, sure. I mean, you're right. Everybody does show emotions different. I mean, as a police officer, he was a cop for 18 years. He's, he's been to several of these types of calls. But again, I think you circle back to it is his wife. It's his loved one. It's the mother of his kids. Uh, that's a completely different dynamic. And so could he argue that that's just the way he handles uh, trauma? Sure. Uh, but again, if you go back and look at all the, the digital evidence that they have with the text messages, that's that's pretty hard to uh, to prove his uh, his statement and alibi. I mean, I think that. Yeah. And look, I'll say even the, the video, the recording is pretty bad in and of itself. Um, I, I do want to ask you the idea of if he's this meticulous and we'll talk about the ability to stage a scene in a minute. But if he's this meticulous um, and killed his wife. Is it strange that he first consented to a search and then said, actually, no. I mean, that's he would have to know that seems suspicious, right? Well, I think it might. I think it would look more suspicious on his part if they're like, hey, they're wanting his full cooperation. If he had nothing to do with this, why wouldn't you hand over your cell phone and give consent to search the house and your phone? That, that could have been the angle that he was going. And then maybe he started to learn that they're looking deeper into this. And then that's when he decides, OK, if they're going to start looking at me like I'm a potential suspect, I think anybody should invoke their rights and, hey, not give consent to start searching your house, your phone. Uh, that's, you know, that's to protect yourself. So 
the, probably the route that he went down. Um, and, and honestly, as an investigator, if you're there at a think this might not be a, uh, you're probably going to want to go with the search warrant, warrant route anyways and not just go off of consent. When you're investigating a case like this, what are some of the telltale signs you look for to point to the idea that the, sta the scene was possibly staged? Are there things that jump out to you immediately? What do you think they might have been looking for? Walk us through that. Yeah, so when you go to these calls, I mean, they're, they're very interesting and, and you, you don't ever want I think some of the things that you look for are, okay, this is a husband and wife in a, in a relationship. They're going through a divorce. They had an argument the night before. Um, he was having an affair with somebody else. He's, he quit his job in lieu of termination. Um, she's filing court documents against him trying to get, obtain restraining orders. You start looking at all of that, and as an investigator, even as a patrol cop, you, you're on scene for something like that. Things just aren't adding up, and you're going to want to give that the, the fullest amount of attention and, and investigate everything uh, until you reach a dead end to prove that it's not. And how difficult is it to stage a scene like that? Well, I've, ne I've never. I, I don't know. That's good. But, uh, That's good to know. I mean, but most people, yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it sloppy? Is it, uh, do you look back and you say, you know, it's not the easiest thing to stage or is it, uh, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I mean, I, I think people, especially a prior police officer who's been to probably dozens of these especially someone that has shot themselves. I mean, guns land in different ways. They fall out of your hand differently. You're going to have gunshot residue on the person's hand, the victim's hand. Uh, you know, would he have gunshot residue on him? It would depend if he's washed his hands. And then the affidavit said while the cops were on scene, he washed his hands. So that's all, that would all be problematic. But I, I mean, you could probably do your best. To, to I'm not saying it hasn't worked, but uh, the reality is, is when all that evidence starts compiling up and they start looking more and more into it, you're going to have experts that, that come in and can disprove a lot of things. Uh, and an interesting note for women who, uh, generally speaking, and there's data out there to prove this, but uh, they actually shoot themselves in the chest uh, often and not not in the head. So, oh wow, that also that also could be uh, a red flag for an investigator on scene to just just one more thing to look at. Any idea why that is? Um, I think the belief is that, you know, women take pride in themselves. Women where they actually, um, I've seen women put their wedding dress on. I've seen them dress very nicely, put makeup on. And I think the theory is they don't want to disfigure their face at all. And so um, they'll shoot themselves in, in the heart or in the chest. Wow. Uh, one thing we didn't touch upon, a little weird motive. Because it's not like Shay was trying yeah. to cover up an affair. His wife already knew about it. He was already resigned because of the discovery uh, of the affair. And this seemingly was a source of contention between them. It seemed like she was troubled by it, but all, but it wasn't like he was trying to hide it in any way or prevent it from, from you know, from ending his marriage or prevent it from um, his job being lost. It just feels strange. If he did this, what would be the motive? And I, as I've said this before a thousand times, prosecutors, they don't have to prove motive. It's impossible sometimes to know why somebody did it. You yeah. can't prove that. But why do you think he did this if he did this? Yeah, like you said, it's not so much the motive. It's, I don't know. I think if you think about it, I, I've been to a lot of homicides and, and especially we have couples like this, you're going through a divorce. Sometimes it just boils down to not wanting to give up uh, custody of their kids, wanting to have their children full time. You know, who knows? It could be anything. But yeah, you're right. It is. It is odd that it wasn't like he's trying to cover this up. He's you know, he's probably not trying to be with this other woman. Um, it seemed like maybe he was trying to make their marriage work. You know, I don't know. But um, I think a lot of times it, this stuff gets really ugly and divorces get ugly and it boils down to a lot of times just custody of kids. And look, to, to put a human element on this, uh, uh, the Orange County Sheriff John Mina uh, issued a statement uh, surrounding the death of, again, his former colleague. And it reads in part, we have all struggled this week with feelings of shock, grief, and guilt while we tried to make sense of Ellie's death, which was meant. We pray for her two girls, the rest of her family, and all of those who love her. Now, Kyle, as we finish this up, obviously the death of a member of law enforcement is always a sad day, it's a tragedy, 
But the idea that it was allegedly perpetrated by another member or former member of law enforcement, does that get you angry? We've talked before about cases where law enforcement have been found guilty of wrongdoing or accused of wrongdoing. Does that get you angry when you see something like this? Yeah, I think anytime you see stuff like this in the law enforcement community, it's just, it's a scar not only on the entire community of law enforcement, but I mean, that's a huge scar on that agency. I, I mean, they have to uh, deal with one of their own uh, killing another one of their own um, superior officers. She's a lieutenant at the agency. I mean, she's at, at an executive staff level. So that's uh, tough. I mean, think of all the people that know them there, you know, who are friends with this guy, who are friends with her. It's it's devastating. But honestly, I truly think that the biggest victims in this whole thing are going to be those those kids that they have. I mean, yeah. they just lost, they lost their mom, and now if their dad's found guilty, they're gonna they're gonna lose their father too. And so they just lost both their parents over this entire thing. Really, really sad case, really, really disturbing case. And yeah. hearing how it unfolded is just incredible. Uh, Sergeant Kyle Schoberg, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it, sir. Absolutely, Jesse. It's always a pleasure. Thank you.